Hello, I want to discuss Matthew chapter 5 for a few moments. Uh, it's the Come Follow Me readings. Uh, I'll give you a couple of teaching helps, but mostly I want to deepen your own personal understanding of this so you can help see the vision, uh, at least in part, of what the Lord wants us to learn from Matthew chapter 5. Now, there's some fun things you can do. I mean, I already shared some of these with some of my teachers, right? Go get a candle. Now, if you're in a church building, you can't light it. No open flames. I know the policy. But if you're at home, uh, turn out all the lights late at night and, and light a candle. And let everyone's eyes get adjusted to the candle. And then blow it out and have them describe the darkness. Then light a match again and light it and see how much light it can give. And then turn on the bright lights. Have that great discussion about being the light and so forth. You can get a salt shaker. Salt of the earth. Put some dirt in there. Mix it up and say, try to separate the dirt from the salt and use it on your dinner tonight. You just you can't, right? So there's some fun analogies you can do there and help teach. You can do that in a primary class or at home or in a seminary or institute class. But I want to go to a, a new section that sometimes we just touch on briefly, but I want you to go a little deeper with this today. Uh, we know from... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and Doctrine and Covenants, section 76, there's three degrees of glory. But there's another verse I want you to look at about these three degrees, right? Go to Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 36. Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, starting with verse 36. Verse 36 six says, all kingdoms have a law given. So today I want to talk about law for a few moments. And there are many kingdoms, and there is no space which there is no kingdom, and there is no kingdom which there is no space, either a, a greater or lesser kingdom. But verse 38, unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there are certain bounds also and conditions. In other words, every kingdom has a law, and you have to live that law to live in that kingdom. So what I would do if I were teaching this class, I would divide my chalkboard into thirds. Just draw two lines down it. So you have three things. I say we got three laws here, three kingdoms, telestial, terrestrial, and celestial. And I'll say, if I want to live in the celestial kingdom, I have to know and understand its law. If I want to live in the United States, I should know and understand the laws of that, of that country, right? It's no difference from these eternal laws. So let's take a look and see what Jesus did in Matthew 5. Because he is going to fulfill the law of Moses, which is not a celestial law. So again, go to Matthew 5 for a moment. And go to verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What he's going to really do is he's going to take the group of people who will follow him and move them from that law of Moses or that terrestrial law up to a celestial law or the law of Christ. So on my chalkboard, I would go to the middle law and I would write law of Moses. And then I'd go onto the far left side and I'd say, okay, there is a lower law. It's the law of the world, or you can humorously call it the law of the jungle, right? I mean, there are laws in the jungle. The gorillas don't just eat all the animals because they can, or the tigers just don't eat all the animals because they can. They only eat the ones that provide a purpose. So there are laws even in the jungle, just they're not very high laws. They're animalistic. Law of Moses is much higher. But the Savior is going to teach the higher law, or the law of Christ. So let's go through a few of these examples that he uses in Matthew chapter 5. Start with verse 21. And you can mark a couple things in here every single time. So you can identify where these at. Teach your students this. Ye have heard. Every time he says that, he's saying, you know the law of Moses. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Okay, that's the law of Moses. That's just a key phrase the Savior's using to identify. Here's the old law. So what's the old law in verse 21? Thou shalt not kill. So on the middle of the board, I would write, thou shalt not kill. And they say, okay, if that's the law of Moses, what's the law of the jungle? Again, do you just kill anybody and everybody? No, tigers don't do that. Lions don't do that. 
Gorillas don't just do that. They kill when it is to their advantage. So in the worldly sense, and bringing this up to humans, the world says, you know what, if it's to your advantage, you can kill someone and get something from it, like kind of an Cain situation, go do it. That's the law of the world. The law of Moses says you don't kill people. The Savior is going to take him to a higher law. Notice verse 22. What's the higher law? Don't even be angry. See, the law of Moses is focused on the action. As long as you're not killing, you can hate somebody. You can be angry with them. Just don't kill them. But the Savior says, I want you to go way beyond that. I want you to not even be angry. Which what he's really trying to say is uh, love, right? Matthew 22, verse 39. Previously, the first commandment is love God. The second commandment is well, love your neighbor. The Savior's trying to teach love. Don't be angry. Don't get mad. Love people. So here, if you're taking a look at the three degrees of glory, which kingdom do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a kingdom where people are killing each other for certain advantages? Do you want to live in a place where, okay, nobody's going to kill anybody here, but you might hate some people, be angry at people? Or do you want to live in a place where there's only love and kindness towards one another? Those are the three laws that you're choosing right now. And the one you choose to live will determine which kingdom of glory you will receive. See that pattern? Let's do the next one. Go down to verse 27. Verse 27, ye have heard, again, law of Moses, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what's the Savior going to do to this one? He says, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery in his heart. So I want you to think about this for a moment. What's the law of the jungle? Well, it's probably you can have a, a, a sexual relationship with whoever you want. Uh, not just anybody. We're in a world now that doesn't say you can have a sexual relationship with anybody as long as it's consensual and uh, th then it's okay. But the law of Moses says, no, you get married. And then you only have that sexual relationship with somebody who you're married. The Savior's taken us way even beyond that. Uh, don't even lust after people. Uh, again, what is it? Love. It's uh, Doctrine and Covenants 42, verse 22. It's the only commandment outside of the Lord where we're commanded to love somebody with all of our heart, and that's our spouse. Can you imagine living in a celestial kingdom where people are lusting after other people? No, of course that's not going to exist there. So if I want to live in the celestial kingdom, I need to live the celestial law, which means my heart is turned only to my spouse, who I love, and I don't lust after anyone. Uh, so again, that now we can take a look at these first two. Where's the world today? Well, the world's in the law of Moses with killing, right? We still believe that thou shalt not kill. We just don't go kill people, right? Even if it's to our advantage, we don't go kill people. But on the thou shalt not commit adultery, we have definitely, we used to be at the law of Moses, but definitely over the last uh, hundred years, we have slipped into the sexual revolution, as the world has termed it, right? Instead of being uh, pure hearts and so forth. Now, if I were a teacher and I was ta talking about these two laws of Christ, I probably would ask some questions that would help bring in the Savior. Like, how can the, help, how can the Savior help me live this law when the world doesn't seem to live this law? How can the Savior help me repent and see and feel and love somebody who I'm mad at. Uh, the next one goes right with this. So go to Matthew 5, 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now this one can be a very sensitive topic, especially for those who have gone through divorce or their parents are divorced or, or whatever it might be. Uh, but let's state the law and be very clear with this. Obviously, in the world, sexual relations are with anyone you want, right? Adultery is okay in Hollywood as long as you love the person or it's consensual or as long as their marriage isn't happy, so it's okay. 
Whereas here, it's very clear that the Savior said, you don't commit a sexual relationship or you don't leave your spouse unless you give them a writing of divorcement. So what is that in the law of Christ? Well, in the celestial kingdom, there aren't, there isn't divorce. I mean, there's nobody living in the celestial kingdom that says, you know what, I'm going to get a divorce and move on to somebody else. Um, that doesn't exist in the celestial kingdom. No, again, here we got to be very careful. We don't live in the celestial kingdom right now. We live in a terrestrial, well, a telestial world, and sometimes living, trying to live our best to survive with a, a terrestrial world. Meaning, the church has clarified this very clearly. Divorce is acceptable today, especially in certain circumstances, right? Where, again, looking up above, if love is the law of Christ in some marriages, it's not only been a lack of love, but a very uh, bitter hatred that's belittled a spouse. If that's the case, um, it's acceptable in the church to be divorced. So I want to emphasize that. But I really want to teach the law of Christ here is what I want to do is... In the celestial kingdom, there isn't divorce. That doesn't mean someone wasn't divorced on earth, you know, eons ago. That's saying during that time period, husbands love their wives and wives love their husbands. And you have to help teach that and clarify that. So maybe the question here you ask, how can a spouse or how can a child uh, allow the atonement of Jesus Christ to help forgive a parent or a spouse or to become... So you're not bitter. So you're full of love. Because if you have anger and hatred towards a parent who got divorced or who left you or a spouse who divorced you or was horrible to you, those feelings don't exist in a celestial kingdom. So the atonement must come in and remove those feelings for us. That is the celestial kingdom that I want to live in. No bitter feelings. No hatred. No enmity. All of those are gone. In verse 32, the word fornication is used in our King James Version in English. The Greek word, and my pronunciation of Greek is, don't, don't use it, <laughs> but it's porneas, P-O-R-N-E-I-A-S. That's the Greek word. Normally, when we translate that word, from Greek to English, they use the word, the English word pornography. It refers to sexual impropriety or impurity. Here, the whoever translated the King James in this verse chose the word fornication. But the meaning is much, much broader than just fornication. It refers to all immoral behavior. Let's do another one. How about verse 33? Ye have heard that it hath been said of them by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself. Well, uh, just what does that mean, forswear thyself? Basically, that's making a, a promise, false promise. So again, law of the jungle, make promises even if you don't have no intention of keeping them. It won't hurt anybody, right? Or it's to your advantage. Law of Moses, make promises, but don't make false promises. Well, the law of the Savior is even more clear. Don't ever make promise. You don't need to. You promise, pinky promise. You got to make a pinky promise. Well, the only reason you would ask someone to make a swearing oath is because their word isn't good unless they do that. They've made false promises before. So here we're just saying, or the, what the Lord is saying is, everything you should say should be truthful. So you don't ever have to say pinky promise because you know that everything that person said is always truthful. Verse 38, an eye for an eye, right? Law of Moses. So if someone punches you, punch him back. That's the law of Moses. Law of the jungle, you initiate the punch, right? Law of Moses, you don't punch somebody unless they've punched you. Again, now the Savior, what does he say? Verse 39, turn the other cheek. Verse 41, Go the extra mile. Both of those are conditions of loving your neighbor, loving other people beyond what they deserve. That is the atonement of Jesus Christ in its entirety. Somebody, Jesus Christ, suffered for everybody else 
even though he didn't deserve it. And the Savior is asking us, be like me. Suffer. If somebody punches you, turn the other cheek and take it on the other cheek. Suffer because you love him or her. And verse 43, how about this one? Ye have heard that, that it hath been said, love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Again, here we know in verse 44, the Savior says, love your enemies. Love everybody. So, in conclusion, you take a look at your three degrees of glory, your three laws, and ask yourself, where do I really want to live? What do I want to, who, who do I want to be with? What do I want to be like? And then say, how can the Savior help me? live this celestial glory where there is truly peace and happiness and love everywhere. I hope that's helpful in your personal and your class preparation and you enjoy teaching this week.